Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to our day four of our Youth Ministry Now lecture conference and lunch series here at Yale Divinity School. We are in day four, and we have the home team is joining us today from Yale Divinity School. We're delighted today to welcome the Reverend Dr. Yolanda Smith, who has for 13 years been on the faculty at Yale Divinity School, where she teaches, among other things, Christian education. She is the president of the Religious Education Association, and she is going to speak with us today about movement as embodied worship. And she comes to us uh, really wonderfully equipped to do this because she brings not only her years of scholarship and not only her years as an ordained Baptist minister and serving churches in local churches, but she is also a lifetime dancer and certified to teach dance. It was her minor in college, and she's been teaching dance across the years. Uh, I, I know this is going to be a wonderful talk, and that may inspire you to also want to get a work that she's written that addresses some of these topics. It is Reclaiming the Spirituals, New Possibilities for African American Christian Education, where she includes a discussion on the use of dance and movement in worship. Uh, we are delighted to welcome today the Reverend Dr. Yolanda Smith. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Skip. Uh, I really wanted to uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm excited to have this opportunity to share with the group. We'll have two scripture readings, and then we'll have an opportunity to kind of reflect, and then we'll end with a closing prayer. I'd like to invite you now to take a deep breath and to reflect on what does it mean to engage in worship, and what does it mean to bring your whole self your whole soul, your whole body to that worship. I've invited two people to share with us uh, two passages of scripture, and I'm going to invite them now to, to read for us. And what I'd like you to do as the scripture is being read is to think about what are the images of dance and worship that emerge for you as you think about the song, as you think about the dance that you saw <clears throat> on screen, and then as you hear the word of God. So let's hear the word of God, and then um, you have a large index card um, uh, at the table. Grab one of those cards, and then I want you just to jot down real quickly some of the images that come to mind. So may I have our readers, please. We'll be reading from Exodus chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. Miriam, the sister of Aaron, was a prophet. So she took her tambourine and led the other women out to play their tambourines and to dance. Then she sang to them, Sing praises to the Lord for his great victory. He has thrown the horses and their riders into the sea. Amen. I'm reading from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. <clears throat> now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed this house of Obededom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. And David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obadiah into the city of David with gladness. And so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, took, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Thank you for reading the scriptures. Take just a moment now to jot down some of the images that emerge for you as you think about dance, movement, worship, and youth. Okay, what were some of the images that emerged for you? A 
uninhibited expression of the soul. Wonderful. Un uninhibited expression of the soul. <clears throat> um, many things came to me, but one that um, surprised me a little was defiance. Okay. Absolutely, defiance. And even if we think about David, um, he danced regardless of, you know, the protocol was he was the king. And his wife looked out and saw him and she despised him. But in defiance, he praised, the God, praised God regardless. Amen. We must be on the same side of the room. I was going to say swarm, flock, unison movement yes. of a community. L uh -huh. like, almost like an animal would do, like a beehive. Okay, wonderful, yes, absolutely. Any other images? I saw a total victory over the enemy. Total victory total over the victory. enemy. Say a little bit more about that. What do you mean by that? They um, were able to see the power and the movement of God on their behalf, mm -hmm. even in the darkest hour. Mm -hmm. and they were able to worship God in spite of, mm -hmm. um, you know, being under, you know, attack. Okay, absolutely. So they saw God move. The movement of God and worshiping God even in the midst of despair. Yes. And just to sort of echo what this brother was saying, I, I saw expectation and jubilee. So there was an expectation but they were celebrating the outcome already. Okay, all right, expectation and jubilee. Yes, dance can be an opportunity to celebrate, to have joy beyond just the words and beyond just the music, but it embodies our total being. And that's what David did, that's what Miriam and the women did, and that's what we saw these young people doing on the screen. They were just, it was complete abandon, just celebration in the spirit of God. We'll take one more and then we'll move on. Any other reflections? Yes. Pardon? Spirit of warfare. The spirit of warfare. Okay, absolutely. It could be used as a, as a way of surrounding yourself, empowering yourself, and rejecting the enemy. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. So remember I told you that we're going to all participate in movement and now is that time. We're going to close this meditation with a prayer and it's called a body prayer. And I'm going to invite you all to stand. It's a little calmer than the prayer that we saw, the, the dance piece that we saw on the screen. I will show you the movements first. And I learned this several years ago, and I've used it in a variety of different settings. And the words change uh, depending on what the setting is. So you can take this body prayer and you can use it, adapt it for whatever uh, community you might be in. So all you have to do is just follow me. You may want to spread out just a little bit. Follow me. The first movement is centering. The second one is praise and thanksgiving. The next one is remembering all of my cares and concerns. Releasing them is the next one. And the last one is remembering the cares of the world, those who are hurting, who are broken, who are in need of God's healing power. And then we come back to centering. So we'll do this prayer three times. We'll do it in silence. And it's called a body prayer. And as we lift up our prayer, we lift up all of the gifts that were named this morning, that they will surround us throughout this time. So let's begin.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Skip mentioned that um, I have a background in dance, and as far back as I can remember, I have loved to dance. I was one of those kids <clears throat> that once the music came on, my hips started shaking, my head started bopping, my shoulders started moving, and I was up and all over the house, spinning around, turning, and dropping down in a dramatic fashion. In fact, when my mom would call me, I didn't just get up and walk over and ask my mother what she wanted. I would leap out of the chair and I'd spin around and I'd, yes, mama? <laughs> She thought that I was crazy because all I wanted to do was dance. Dance made my heart sing because it allowed me to express myself when words were not enough. And sometimes it was just the movement of my hands, the tapping of my feet, and other times it was full-bodied involvement in terms of dance. As Skip indicated, I, I, did, uh, I, wanted, I, I wanted to be a dancer. That was one of my dreams. I had two dreams in life when I was a child. I wanted to be a dancer professionally and had a dream of dancing with Alvin Ailey. <laughs> uh, and the other dream was that I wanted to go into the ministry. And I didn't know how I was going to combine the two. I just knew that I loved both of them because God had a call on my life when I was 17 years old, and I knew that. But I wanted to dance. I remember as a child, we joined a Baptist church, and um, we were new members of this congregation, and I remember going to the Sunday school class, and the teacher asked, well, what do you like to do for fun? And I said, well, I love to dance. And the lady looked at me at the, you know, through her glasses that were perched on the end of her nose, and she said, dance? Don't you know that dance is a sin? Children don't dance in this church. And I was devastated, absolutely devastated. And I cried all the way home. My mother couldn't understand what was going on. And then finally, I told her that, you know, that they told us that we're not allowed to dance in this church. We can't go back to any of our dance classes. And my mother said, ain't nobody going to tell me whether or not my children have the opportunity to dance. And so the next morning, she took me and my two sisters down to the dance studio and enrolled us in every class that she could find. <laughs> so we did ballet, tap, jazz, all the way through uh, high school. I performed uh, in many plays and in many dance concerts. And um, I would have majored in dance uh, when I was in college, but my father said, oh no. What you want to do is get a d degree in something where you can get a real job. <laughs> so I ended up going into education because I loved education as well. Um, and I had so many classes in dance that I really could have declared a second major, but I didn't know that I could do that at the time. So I minored in dance and was certified to teach and taught high school um, in special education, which is what my primary degree was. But then I also um, used movement and taught uh, seventh through twelfth grade. Um, it was, it was certified to teach seventh through twelfth grade dance as well. So I danced throughout college. I danced even after college, and um, I finally had that call to the ministry. And I was probably about seventeen or eighteen years old, and I didn't know what it meant at the time, but I knew that God had a call on my life. That God wanted me to do something. And I truly thought that my dancing days were over. So I went on to college and started teaching high school for a while and worked with some of the kids. I coached the cheerleaders and things of that nature. And um, then later on, I started working in my church full time. And um, I asked the pastor whether or not we could start a dance ministry. And I thought I would start with just aerobics classes, you know, for anybody who wanted to come. We'll, we'll start an adult class and then maybe we would open it up and invite children to come and, and offer a variety of different classes. And I was thrilled about this opportunity, but at the time, the congregation was not ready. Uh, so over in this corner, the folks were rumbling about, well, what are they going to be wearing? What are they going to be doing? What kind of music are they going to be listening to? What do you mean, dance in the church? We can't have dance in the sanctuary. You know, and so then there was a group over here that said, oh, it's a great idea, it's a great idea, you should pursue it. So I went to the pastor and I 
gave him every scripture I could find, including the David scripture <laughs> and the Miriam scripture on dance. And I said, dance is a way for us to express ourselves to, in worship. There are so many times when we sing and we pray, we read scripture, we preach the word, we fellowship with one another, but dance allows us to commune with God in a way that words often cannot. And so eventually I convinced the pastor and we started off very conservatively. We always wore big pants and long shirts <laughs> to make sure our bodies were covered up. And um, to kick off our dance uh, program, I was honored when the pastor asked if I would do a solo dance in the sanctuary on the highest holy day of the Christian calendar on Easter Sunday. And the church was filled to the brim. People were spilling out into the North Ax and to the, the East Wing and the West Wing. And here I come in my little skirt and my ballet slippers, and I performed to Lionel Harris's Rise Again. And from that moment on, we've had a dance drama ministry for young people and for adults. We have uh, a praise dance team, and women my age and older <laughs> are praising God through dance and flags and streamers and all of that in worship. And it brings a whole new dimension to what it means to worship God. And so I was truly honored to be able to be a part of that movement. And now we've moved beyond just the basic liturgical dance, which is what we think about oftentimes, um, to a uh, movement that includes hip hop, similar to what we saw, um, drill team stomping, um, clowning, and I'll say a little bit more about some of these uh, later on in, in the workshop. <clears throat> so that has been my experience in dance, and um, I still dance <laughs> um, and as often as I can. I think I find myself walking, running, stretching, and doing those things more than I do dancing these days, but I still find that it brings me joy. It makes my heart sing, and it allows me to come out of myself and to express God with my entire being. And so today I hope that we can inspire you and that you can inspire your youth to find that dance movement or that way of embodied worship that helps them to grow deeper in their faith. <clears throat> I'd like to take just a moment to ask you uh, a question. Um, and everybody doesn't have to answer. I'm just going to open the floor for a minute. But Think of a memorable experience that you've had with dance, whether it be in the church or outside of the church, a memorable experience that you've had with dance, um, particularly in worship, let's say in worship, and what was the most significant thing about that experience that stood out for you? A memorable experience that you've had, either watching, observing, or participating, and what was the most significant thing that stood out for you? Yes. Well, I would say that I was a counselor, a camp counselor for a week, and before that week, I would always be afraid to raise my hands and be afraid to worship outwardly. And uh, I was at camp, and I saw these young kids, like under 12, just praising God and being open about it. And before that, I felt like the devil always kind of won that battle with me wanting to raise my hands, wanting to do that. And then when I became open to worship outwardly, it felt like, you know, like God was getting the glory and honor for that victory and that I wasn't allowing, you know, my mind to stop me from worshiping him. Amen. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Finding freedom, finding your voice, really, in a sense. I recently attended the um, ordination of a bishop, and he had a dance portion in the ceremony. And this, uh, this dance was just so phenomenal. It, um, when it first started, you kind of just had, you know, was, they were dressed in the olden uh, old clothing of olden, of olden days. And as you watched it, you, this story, you could see this story unfolding. You know, some of the dancers would go off and they'd come in more contemporary clothing. So you saw the time changing mm -hmm. in the wardrobe. Uh, even the movements were changing. Mm -hmm. And I learned that it was a collaboration of like three or four churches. So, you know, so kudos to the choreographer that had to put that thing together. But it was amazing. Wow. Just the story that they were able to tell 
and body movement. Yes. It was awesome. So it brought the text alive, basically. It brought the gospel story alive, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Hi, Karen. <laughs> You mentioned Alvin Ailey, and um, that brought back a memory that my husband and I had tickets to go see Alvin Ailey, and it was just a few days after the Newtown shooting. Yeah. And I thought, this is the last thing on earth I'd like to do. But we kind of dragged ourselves into the city, and it could, it, there was nothing better to have done to just enjoy that beauty. And it, it ended up working its way into a sermon the following Sunday when I was talking right. about an antidote for despair was to, to, to enter mm -hmm. into beauty and preferably a wordless kind. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that resonated with the, um, with the congregation. Absolutely. And it's great to see Wonderful. You. Thank you. We'll take one more and then we'll move on. Oh, um, the first experience I had with dance in the church was not a positive one. Okay. Like you, I love to dance, but it was a separate life from my church life. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had a new pastor some years ago and she had some um, dancers come to the church and they were doing, it was not a liturgical dance, it was an Irish something. They, were, they had practiced at school and they came to the church and they did it during, some, and I was totally, I couldn't relate to it. I, I couldn't figure out where that fit. And you know, we were unprepared, the whole congregation mm -hmm. was unprepared for this introduction of these kids dancing in front of the cross. And I felt hurt, mm -hmm. but I went home and I did a lot of prayer. And like you, I went to the scriptures and so on. And I kind of, it took me a while to come to terms with the fact that this is just another gift, like mm -hmm. singing or whatever else we do. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a special gift mm -hmm. and they can bring it to, to God. Mm -hmm. So I think the traditional thinking may have to be prepared yes. or they'll have that <laughs> negative experience that I had. Thank you for sharing that, because everyone uh, doesn't receive dance in the same way, particularly in the sanctuary. Um, and so there will be some preparation for many congregations um, if this is something that you see yourself doing. Now, are there any, any of you here that have dance or experience dance in your congregations? Can you say something about your, your program? Years ago, I was a, um, a praise dancer, and I was thinking about the first um, time that I'd ever praise danced publicly. It was accepted in our church, um, and it was something that um, one of the youth leaders decided that, you know, we really need to get these young ladies involved in some aspect of worship, and one of those ways was dance. And um, I, you know, I just remember us spending so much time on the preparation and you know, we got to have the leotard and you have to have this and you have to have that until when we got up to actually dance, it was so liberating and freeing. And I wish the focus had been on the actual worship experience more so than the preparation and, right. um, <laughs> but um, anywho, we, I mean, it was just so freeing and so liberating and, um, and it was nice to see that the congregation was receptive to it. Um, I'm sure there were some that were probably hesitant at first, but uh, the more we got out there and danced and it, the more it became a part of worship and to the point where our pastor, which is my father at the time, had requested us to dance almost every Sunday. Okay. So we'd have different teams who would dance during worship and mm -hmm. it just became another expression of worship. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yes. Key, another expression of worship. It's another way that we can engage and invite the community to worship together. Yes. Yeah. We currently have a small dance troupe at our church. It's completely kid-driven. I don't think they even have an adult advisor. They just work with the pastor and fit it in where they can. But a couple of years ago when they came to people and said, we want to do this, and some of the oldsters stood around and went, until someone uh, brought some pictures back in from the 20s when there was a dance troupe in our church, kind of oh. Isadora Duncan, oh. um, <laughs> Greek costume kind of thing. Yes, yes. And it was no holds barred after that. So right. there was Wonderful. precedent. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Anyone else uh, have a dance program? Yes, at your church. <clears throat> Um, it's actually interesting. We started a couple of years ago, 
And um, it's one of our deacons who started the dance okay. um, ministry. He has his own dance company for so many years before he was called to be a deacon. And he started to do the dance ministry and, you know, everyone got involved. And initially, because it's a very conservative church, Baptist church, and some of the people did the same thing. They shook their heads. Oh, no, we can't have this in the sanctuary. But once the first time the youth danced, everyone was blown away. Mm-hmm. So now some of the deaconess want to start their own dance ministry and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So it was the older women getting involved now. Mm-hmm. But it's a beautiful thing. It mm-hmm. really is. Absolutely. And it bridges the gap between the older and the younger. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Do one more. <laughs> um, not only do we have the youth and praise dancing, but they extended it. And now they have the um, older generation. And they actually do line dancing. Okay. And All you right. would be surprised at the seniors who are actually downstairs learning how to line dance. And when <laughs> we have our, our picnics and family gatherings, Right. They all get together and they do line dancing. So mm-hmm. it has really expressed an opening for dancing in the church. Amen. Great. Thank you. So our purpose then today is to explore movement as embodied worship. We want to try to inspire our youth to deepen their sense of spirituality, their spiritual journey in ways that words and songs alone cannot do. And really, it's just a matter of providing the opportunity for them, inviting them to come with their gifts and their own styles and to begin to explore that. Today, we want to also experience different forms of dance and worship. So at the very beginning of our meditation, I showed you one form of worship um, in uh, a dance movement in worship. And then our closing prayer was a different form of, of worship. And then um, towards the end, we'd like to explore ways to integrate dance into the church. So that will be our goal today as we move forward. But the first question I want to ask you, and you probably are wondering, why is she asking that question? But what is dance? What is dance? When you think about dance, what comes to mind? It's a language, yes, absolutely, yes. Expression. I've always experienced it as, I I sound like you when you were a kid, I had the similar experience. So for me, um, I later understood it as a way that um, God's spirit was speaking to me in a home that didn't have, we didn't go to church on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I always experienced the arts as the way the spirit spoke to Mm -hmm. me. So I almost can't, like you, it's like I start doing this immediately. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it's almost like I have excess energy or something. I don't know how to say it, except that it's like energy is pouring through me and I have to do something with it. Okay. mm -hmm. Yes, energy, energy pouring through you, through your body, through your being. Any, any other ideas, any other thoughts on, on dance? Yes. I guess to some extent, very similar to what she just said. I look at dance as, as, as the body's expression of, of, of emotion. Yes, absolutely. The body's expression of emotion. Dance is all of those things that you've mentioned. And I just would add just a couple of other things. It's a form of art that engages the body in rhythmic movement. And it can be slow, it can be silencing your body, it can be fast, it can be jerky, smooth. It's a form of communication, nonverbal communication. We've, we've mentioned that earlier, but it's a way that we can express ourselves and communicate not only with one another, but communicate with God. It's a way of expressing ourselves and it's a way of engaging socially with one another. And dance is a form of spiritual offering or embodied worship. It's a way that we can offer ourselves to God. Sacred dance, there are many types of dance that um, as you'll see as we go through our presentation today, but sacred dance is really prayer. And sacred dance is what distinguishes religious dance or liturgical dance from any other kind of dance. So there's dance that you do in the bar, there's a dance that you do at home um, that may not necessarily be uh, the type of dance that would 
usher us into the presence of God or deepen our sense of, of uh, communing with God. So when we think about sacred dance, sacred dance is a prayer. It is a form of prayer and it is done individually so you can do it by yourself in the quietness of your home um, or you can do it as a part of a group. And the body then is used to commune with God, to gain spiritual insight, or to seek healing. I had a, had a, a time and still currently have some challenges with health. And um, I found that as soon as I felt like I could get up, the first thing I wanted to do was move. And if I did the body prayer, if I just processed around the house in a meditative and creative way, it was a way for me to settle myself, to tune into my body, and to be open to the spirit of healing in my life. So sacred dance allows us then to commune with God in a deeper and more spiritual way. There are several types of sacred dance. So if you're thinking about ways that you want to engage young people, these are different types of dances that you might think about or different ways that we can dance. Ecstatic dance. That's when the dance becomes so energetic and so um, focused that oftentimes the dancers are left in a trance. Now that might sound a little scary, um, but I'm thinking of historically during the time of slavery. Many of you may have heard of the ring shout dance, which was a, a dance that was done to the African-American spirituals. And the congregation would steal away at night because it was against the law for slaves to commune, to have worship together. So they would sneak out at night, go into the bushes, and they would sing songs, they would read the scriptures, and they would just shuffle like this in a circle as they would sing the songs and they'd start off slow, and then eventually the song would pick up and pick up and pick up and pick up until they were spinning around, spinning around, spinning around, spinning around until they were caught up in what we call the Holy Ghost. And that would be an example of ecstatic dance. Um, ritualistic dance is a dance that involves ritual. It involves the entire congregation, so it is, uh, it is the ritual. It is the entire ritual begins with the dance, and the dance is the ritual that we participate in. And then the liturgical dance, which is really the oversight of, of what we're going to be talking about. But it's also what we understand as sacred dance. Liturgical dance is dance that is framed under the notion of faith and religion and spirituality. So sacred dance is what distinguishes dance from all other forms of dance, religious dance, from all other forms of dance, and uh, there are a variety of forms of that, of that. So then, what is liturgical dance? That's really what we're gonna be talking about today. And um, I want you to remember, liturgical dance can be a variety of forms. So it's not just one form of dance, but it can be a multiple um, ways that we engage our body. But it's body movement, it can be an attitude that we have. It, it's not just movement, but so oftentimes it's just creating a shape. A shape. A shape with our hands. That could be a shape. It involves individuals as well as groups. So we can have a solo that's performing or we can have a group. There are different ways that we can do liturgical dance, and there are multiple, multiple movements, but it often includes bowing, bowing in some way, kneeling in some way. These are all basic movements of dance, or we can be standing, as we were doing the body prayer earlier. <clears throat> so it connects with uh, the prayer of the assembly. So in other words, as the congregation prays, as we pray together in community, the dance then helps to usher us into the presence of God, and it is never intended to interrupt. So if your dance program is interrupting worship or disturbing worship or stopping the community from um, communing with God and engaging in prayer, then maybe we need to reflect on the meaning and purpose of the dance that we are 
doing in our, in our churches and in our ministries. So liturgical dance and the Christian tradition, there are several things to keep in mind. Um, it helps us to explore the mysteries, the wonderful mysteries of worship. Okay, you may have seen churches that have a beautiful liturgical procession with all of the elements and the cross and the, the book. Those oftentimes embody mystery. What is it about the mystery of worship that can be explored through dance? <coughs> it celebrates the faith response from the community, and it also engages multiple forms of worship. Liturgical dance can invite us to explore new dimensions of the scripture. Uh, someone had mentioned earlier, I think you, you talked about the, um, the ordination service and how it brought the whole scripture, the gospel, alive. And so new dimensions of scripture can be explored through the body and through movement. It helps to bridge the visible with the invisible. So what we don't see, sometimes we can express it through our bodies. And then it also helps to deepen our prayer life. It um, assumes that there is a faith commitment, so you don't involve yourself in liturgical dance if you don't have a faith commitment, if you don't have prayer, a prayer life. It helps to invite us to engage in intercessory prayer. So it's not just about performance, but it is about praise and worship. Liturgical dance can also invite us to explore the beauty of God, uh, the movement of the Holy Spirit, and then to invite interreligious dialogue and interfaith uh, community and communion with other, with other, communions, other communities. <coughs> so those are some of the basic, um, the basic points that I wanted to mention about um, liturgical dance. But now I want to focus for just a few moments on embodied worship. And I wanted to share with you a quote by John Sweeney, who suggests he was talking about embodied prayer. And this is what he says about embodied prayer. I apologize, I keep moving my jacket over the mic. John Sweeney says, our actions and movements can be expressions of prayer to God. We don't or shouldn't just think our prayers. We can embody the feelings and emotions usually expressed only as spoken or mental prayers in our actions. Prayer can involve our bodies as much as our minds as we commune with God, bless, honor, and petition God, rage in the presence of God, and show our devotion. We can show and express with our bodies what we say and express with our minds. So that's what he says about embodied prayer. But in a similar fashion, embodied worship then, embodied worship then involves worshiping God not only with our minds and our hearts, our voices, but with our whole body. It is engaging the worship experience with gestures, with movements, with ritual, with dance, and embodied prayer. Any thoughts or reflections so far on embodied prayer, embodied worship, and the various forms of dance that we've talked about so far? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there are different types of dance. And um, I'm going to mention five of them today, and we will have an opportunity to explore some of these different forms of dance. But as we go through these forms of dance, think about what are the, what, which one of these dances, and maybe all of them, fit best in your community in which you think your children or your youth can participate in, or maybe they have already participated in? So um, the five forms of dance are procession, proclamation, prayer, meditation, and celebration. So the first one is procession, and I know you've seen procession. Procession, in some minds, is one of the most purest forms of, of dance, the most purest forms of worship. And it's something that we see almost in every congregation. Oftentimes, we'll see it um, 
uh, as the congregation begins and the pastor and all of those who will be participating in the worship process down the aisle. That is a form of dance. That's movement. That's embodied. Procession is direct movement. It's not meandering around here and there all over the place, but it's direct. And it serves a purpose. So the first purpose is entrance, entrance into the worship space, ushering the pastor to the worship space, ushering the participants, the, lit the liturgists, into the worship space. So we're, we're walking. And it can be, I know that in my tradition, it can be something like this as we process <laughs> down the aisle. And in other traditions, it could simply be this. It could be a step, step, turn, or back, 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 and step, and back and step, and back. But we're ushering ourselves into the presence of God. Do any of you have images of procession in your congregation, especially where youth are involved? Yes. <laughs> we meet in a cafeteria for our church, so we've always had a problem with trying to feel like it's a sacred space. So we recently just started having that procession. We have all the children with flags yes. um, processing in. And it really, you know, it, it says a, a little child to lead them. So yes. we really try to embrace that. Very good, good. Any other examples? Yes. Wait, what's really interesting in my church, we have three different services. Uh, the morning service being very traditional. Uh, then the second service somewhat Contemporary is a mixture of both, and then what we call evening song is mm -hmm. very contemporary. Mm -hmm. And there is no procession okay. in the in the morning service. Mm -hmm. The pastors just come from behind the altar doors mm -hmm. and sit. But in the evening song, we have the procession of the cross. There's yes. incense burnings. There are lit uh, lanterns, yes. and there's music. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a procession down the aisle. So mm -hmm. I'm seeing what you're saying in terms of the expression, there's a lot more expression in the evening song, mm -hmm. which we coin contemporary, mm -hmm. as we do in the, uh, than we do in the morning service, which is more traditional. Amen, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, so the entrance into the congregation, and this is a way where young people can involve themselves in movement in the worship, and it's really not threatening. It's a part of uh, moving forward with a purpose, of doing something, entering into the, the sanctuary, um, processing in the gospel. Many congregations will process the gospel in where the book is held up, and sometimes even you know the book can be you know displayed to the entire congregation um, as it processes in. There's a procession of the gifts, the the gifts for um, Eucharist or for communion, as some of us will call it, the bread, the wine and also oil, if there is a, a congregation that engages in um, anointing. Foot washing oftentimes can involve a procession of the, the bowl and, uh, and the towel and the other elements that are used. And then the fourth form of procession is the closing, and that's where we recess out. So we, when we come in, we set the tone for the beginning of our time together in worship, when we close, we recess out, and we say, we're finished. Go and do what God has called you to do in the world. So procession, that's the first form of dance. Another form of dance is proclamation. Proclamation. And this is a form of dance that oftentimes helps us to proclaim the word of God, to tell the word of God. And um, it helps to focus us on the liturgy of the church. It helps to focus us on the creeds of the church. And so proclamation is simply telling, proclaiming, preaching. And dance can be involved in proclamation. You can use the scriptures oftentimes. A lot of times when we think about dance, we think about using some type of music or some kind of voice. Um, but you can actually read a scripture 
And the scripture can be the movement. Um, many times when I dance in churches, I will use scripture um, and will do an interpretive piece to scripture as opposed to music. Um, I, I did a performance once at the AAR, the American Academy of Religion, uh, for the, there was a womanist group, a small group, and um, I decided to use poetry for one of the renowned um, scholars, African uh, women scholars, and um, I didn't know that she was going to be coming to our session. And when I saw her walk in, I said, would you please read for me? And she read to me, and um, I used her poem as a way to begin our time together. So scripture can be um, used in proclamation, and it can be used to interpret, uh, and to involve us in dance. The homiletic, uh, again, um, proclaiming prophecy, and then challenging people, inviting people to live out the word of God. Creedal, again, we can take the, the creeds of the church, and they can be interpreted um, through various movements. And then the spiritual nature of proclamation then is the time where we encourage and nurture and support one another. Prayer. There's another type of dance. We've already talked about prayer as dance. But here now, prayer becomes the primary focus. And so prayer can be movement, as we did the body prayer at the beginning, or it can be in silence. There's another form of dance that we can do with prayer, and it can simply be a gesture. It can simply be a hand prayer, a movement of our hands. So, these can be actions of movements. And movements can be acclaiming, expressing, um, honoring, praising God, or they can be prayers of invocation where we, in, we are inviting the Spirit of God to, uh, to dwell within us and to dwell among our community. And then there's the meditation, meditation prayer. This is a prayer that focuses on reflection, inward silence, quietness, settling. And reflective prayer can also include the homiletic, the prophetic, as well as the inspiring. And then after the communion, meditation prayer can remind us of our um, taking, of the taking of the communion, taking of the elements, and what does that mean for us now as we live out our lives. So what I want to do now is take a minute to um, share with you a meditation prayer. And again, I'm going to invite you to participate as you feel able and inspired. And one of the things that you want to keep in mind, if you're thinking about beginning dance in your congregation, especially with young people, that you always give them the opportunity to opt out. <laughs> because some may not feel comfortable. I remember when I was first started teaching, I always had some kind of dance or movement or poetry in my classes um, here at Yale and also when I taught at Claremont and uh, at Iliff in Denver. And I noticed that the women were always the first ones to jump up and the men were like, please don't make me do that. Um, <laughs> and so then I started to realize that everybody is not as excited about dance as I am. <laughs> Uh, and that people should have the opportunity to say, well, I feel better just being still. And that's okay. I feel better if I just write it down in a poem. That's okay. I feel better if I have an opportunity to draw. So provide paper and markers and paint so that while some are moving around the room, the others are sitting and scribbling. You know what? That's kinesthetic. That's movement. That can still be a form of embodied worship. And then the last one is celebration, a celebration prayer. And basically, this is not necessarily liturgical. It doesn't necessarily be, it, it isn't always a liturgical form of dance, but it can be a part of uh, a worship experience where it helps to an animate or bring the congregation together uh, in some, time of, some type of festive uh, activity. 
And a lot of times, the entire congregation will participate in whatever it is that we're doing. And then it can also be a time where we conclude the celebration in a special way through some form of, of dance. So those are the five different modes of dance that I'd like to share with you. But now I want to turn very quickly. Do we take a break or do we just keep moving? Oh, it's time for a break. OK. Yeah, because <laughs> it'll be easier to transition to what we'll do next afterwards. Um, contemporary trends. So I've showed you some liturgical dance, some hip hop, meditative dance, and we've talked about different forms of dance. But some contemporary trends that I'd like to mention are miming. Miming is uh, simply uh, a creative way of expressing oneself, usually telling a story or making a point. Um, a gesture, oftentimes it's without words. Um, there's hip hop dance. Uh, hip hop has gotten a really bad rap because some of the words have been awful, um, but hip hop really is a form of critique. It's a form of looking at what's going on in the world and challenging that, lifting it up. And uh, so when we bring it into the Christian context, it can still have that prophetic edge the critical edge uh, of analyzing what is and isn't of God, what is or isn't uh, appropriate for us to do, but it's also a form of art, a form of celebration. And we're seeing more and more young people who are taking their hip hop, their love for hip hop, and using it to meditate on their scriptures. There is a, a wonderful resource over here that is a devotional guide, a hip hop devotional guide. And there's a, a, a CD that goes with it. And uh, the gentleman is rapping through the book of John. <laughs> and then there's a meditation and a prayer uh, at the end. Cheerleading is becoming very popular as a way of movement. And clowning. And I want to bring your attention to this CD. It's called Rise. And I have to warn you, it's, it's, it's a really um, edgy piece. And it's about young people in South Central South Africa. South central Los Angeles. And it shows how they've lived in these, these worlds of gang banging, violence, murder, drugs, and all of these horrible things that are all around them. And rather than getting involved in the, that part of the, the world that is around them, they have chosen to participate in something called clowning. And they get the makeup on, and then they start dancing. They do hip, it includes hip hop, popping, it includes crumping. It includes all of these things. It's a really wild ride. But in the end, you see that it's really a place where they can express themselves and have a, a place of meaning. They go into the community, and they take kids off the streets, and they celebrate their birthdays and celebrate their special days. And, um, and they compete against one another. They have these battles. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to, um, to see this DVD, I invite you to, to check it out and watch it. It's at the Ministry Resource Center. And I have to warn you, it's edgy. But I think, uh, <laughs> I think you'll, get the, you'll get the idea. Um, and there are other congregations that are using clowning as a way of exploring the scripture. Yes? What age? Uh, teenagers, I would say, although there are some children in here, but um, I would say high, school, high schoolers, yes. And you, you need to preview it before you show it to your group <laughs> because it might be a, a bit rough. And then uh, there are step teams and drill teams. Um, and I don't know, you, have you all, are you all familiar with what step teams are and what drill, drill teams are? OK, wonderful. Welcome back. We're going to continue now with the Reverend Dr. Yolanda Smith and our presentation on embodied worship. For those of you in the room and those on live stream, I want to again do my daily product placement for inviting you to like our Youth Ministry Now Facebook page. This is a way we can stay in communication with you with respect to our lectures, our programs. We post our videos, et cetera, so you can always find access to what we're doing there. Or I want to invite you again to visit our youthministryinitiative.org website page that has all of the different programs that we're driving through the Youth Ministry Initiative and the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And all of the videos and interviews with each of the scholars are posted there. 
They're readily accessible, they're high definition, and they're excellent vehicles for going home and training staff or centering with uh, lay leaders and preparing them for and equipping them to work with you, so I hope you'll consider that. And just for our folks in the room, I want to appeal to you where we're going to, uh, where our, where Yolanda can repeat your comment, we're fine, but where she can't repeat your comment, you know, our live stream, this amazing technology, this week we've had folks following these lectures in 22 states and 12 countries. But they're not following your comments because if it's not mic, they can't hear it. And uh, a lot of the richness is coming from you. So if you could just, if she's asking for a short comment that, uh, that Yolanda can repeat, we're fine because they'll pick it up on her mic. But if not, would you wait for a mic? And then your wisdom is in nine countries and 22 <laughs> countries. <All right. laughs> Thank you. All right. So those are some of the contemporary trends. Um, and you may have seen some of these dances in church or miming in church or clowning in church or you may be interested in um, providing opportunities for your young people to engage in these various forms of worship. So some concluding comment, comments that I wanted to make before we uh, go into our last part of the, of the workshop is when we think about embodied worship, that there must be some kind of a ritual structure in other words, think about what is the ritual. Is it a ritual of prayer, a ritual of meditation, a, rit a ritual of celebration, um, processing into the congregation? Remember that as we engage in embodied worship, that it's more about the spiritual nature of the dance. It's prayer and not performance. So we don't have a dance team to perform for the congregation. We have a dance team to engage the congregation in worship, to invite the congregation to worship, to challenge the congregation to live out the gospel. And so it is prayer and not performance. It involves um, participants in the ritual action. So again, it's not just the performers or the dancers. It is uh, the entire community. That, uh, that is invited to participate in the ritual action. It is a way of drawing the community together. It's a way of lifting up God, the spirit of God, sharing the gospel, and then um, it is a way of embodying and expressing a prophetic message. <clears throat> Any other comments uh, before we move? Um, this is something I'm really passionate about, your question, and I probably come from the other side because I came in from, um, although I went to church as a young child, I didn't through most of my teen years, and I came back to the church in my 30s, mm -hmm. and now I'm a pastor, so yeah. the road can be long, you know yes, what I'm saying? Yes, and yes. so I, um, and I tend to have a very wide perspective on what is acceptable for us as Christians to experience artistically. Um, I lived in New York City, I have a sister that was a dancer, blah, 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 blah. So I guess, and I've been in this conversation with people before, like what, where do you see God? I see God all the time in things that have nothing, that never say Jesus, that never say God, that never say, I said what I look for in the art that I see is redemption. Mm -hmm. what, I don't care what it says, if I see redemption, then I'm okay with it. So, um, you know, the one, first, the one movie that I had a conversation with someone about was American Beauty. I don't know if any of you saw this oh, yeah. a while ago, and this person had the perspective, no, it wasn't preaching. I said, no, it was preaching. You know, he was redeemed even though he died, blah, 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 you know. So anyway, I just, I'm a little uncomfortable personally with putting restrictions around the way the spirit expresses itself because you never know what is going to reach someone. So, and um, the last thing I'll say is I have kids that are 10 and 11 and they're exposed to all sorts of things that I have no control over as they get older. Mm -hmm. So my son comes home one day and he wants to hear um, Eminem, mm -hmm. you know, and there's one song of Eminem that I love because it, it um, lifts up his uh, recovery from drug addiction, and I forget the name of it now, but somebody out there is going to know it. Um, and it has swearing in it, it has all sorts of stuff, but I let him get that song because I talked to him about it. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, he was down and out. He was mm -hmm. almost losing his wife, his baby, his career, and he is singing this song as in an act of defiance against 
everything that tried to keep him down. So yes, it, but it has swear words, mom, and you let me get it. And I was like, I let you get it because the bigger message right. is this. Right. And then he wanted this other song, um, Shots, 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 shots. You guys know that one? Okay. <laughs> uh, these girls do. These girls know. <laughs> and he said, can I get it? And I was like, no. But you said I could get. No, the message is not good. So that's kind of where I go. Is there redemption? And um, if there is, it's okay with me. I think there was, was there another hand? No. Yes. At the break, I was talking to a couple of my colleagues, and <clears throat> the question was, uh, where do you draw the line? Um, some would perceive this as bringing the world into the church, um, because dancing, we know what it can do. So and then you put this up, and I'm like, there's the answer right there. That's the structure. Those are the dividing uh, um, lines. Um, and I just have to share an experience um, where it's, a lot of it comes, in my opinion, it's, it's motive and purity of heart. When it comes to this, you know, I was at a, a church function, um, and there was various types of worship going on, and there was a gentleman, and this again, this is from my own perspective. There was a gentleman who went uh, to the stage, and it was clear that his um, rendition was to glorify himself and not God. It was just plain. So again, that line in the sand is: Are you glorifying God? Or you glorifying yourself? Is it about the performance, or is it about ushering yourself in? And then I just have to share my perspective on worship. Um, you know, I, I see worship as an opportunity and not an event. Oftentimes, we see this space and time, um, and you, know, you go to church doing praise and worship. If they don't play your favorite song, will you come into the presence of God? So you're waiting for that song and that beat to get you in when it's really an opportunity to enter in. So even if they're not playing your favorite song, what is it in your spirit, what is it in your heart where you can still enter in? So um, it's all about motive and purity of heart. I just want to share that. Movement. When we think about movement as embodied worship, remember that it presupposes a prayer life. It presupposes uh, meditation and study and a faith commitment. So if you are engaging in liturgical dance in whatever form that it is, even the hip hop, um, you know, if you're gonna have a Christian group and they have a dance group, a part of that dance ministry is that they engage in prayer, that they engage in worship, that they engage in studying the word of God, and that hopefully we encourage them through this to do, that e do this even in their personal lives, not only when they gather together um, in, in a communal way. And I know that that's you know, a challenge, but you know, if you don't have a prayer life, then how can you minister? Because you know, that's like me standing up to preach, and I don't pray, and I don't read the text, and I, you know, I just stand up and say, well, I love the Lord, but I don't have anything there, really to share. I've seen a ton of hands. We'll just go around the room here. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad you said that because I feel like, first of all, obviously the things we've seen are people who have incredible comfort with their body, um, have this, have their, their body movement piece and study in addition to their spiritual life. And so I almost feel like the precursor, and maybe this is something you talk on or you could throw out some tidbits and tantalizers for another discussion, is um, Im embodied group building um, because you know my group would be nowhere near this you may just want to invite them uh, maybe uh, if they like hip-hop music um, invite them to listen to the, the rapping of, of one of the, the, the Gospels and maybe just a hand gesture or what would that mean to you what kind of gesture would you give as a result of that and and just do that you know, until you're able to then move it. I think there would need to be some ground, you'd have to lay the groundwork, you know, um, talk about what it is. Uh, and you're going to have some kids who are gonna come and they're ready to do it, and then you're gonna have some who are like, that's just not my thing. And again, there has to be an opportunity to opt out. There has to be an opportunity for them to engage in movement in a different way. So it could be that there's just a big old piece of paper on the ground and all they want to do is scribble on it, or do art, do some kind of an art uh, 
interpretation to the music. Um, but I would say definitely you would start small. You would not start with, um, you know, with something quite this big. And I would start with maybe the hands or start with the drawing or start with the walking, the processing. Um, start with the music, wherever it is that they feel comfortable starting, that's where you would begin. I think there was, yeah. Yes, um, being that I sing, I, um, I like a whole bunch of different types of music, you know, um, different, different styles of music um, in Christianity. And um, Jesus said, like, we're fishers of men, you know, so um, whatever bait you use, that's what kind of fish you're gonna get, you know, so. <laughs> I like using that term, and um, I just like keep stuff real simple when it comes to the word, you know, plain and simple, straight to the point. Um, and that was a good example of the children that was dancing in Central Park. That was, they was pretty much um, living out and pretty much doing the Great Commission, which was to go out, Jerusalem, Judea, and other most parts of the earth, you know, ministering to people and um, bringing them in. So I believe, uh, like a lot of my cousins today and little cousins today, they're not going to come into church, you know, banging Mahalia Jackson and, you know, with some headphones on. Some might, you know, but um, 1 Corinthians 119, I mean, um, 919 says, for I am free for all. I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more for them, of them, to the Jews. I became a Jew. You know, as he goes on about how he went to their level, came to their level, met them where they were, you know, just how God met me where I was. You know, so I believe that um, depending on the bait, what you use, yeah, uh, shower so. the children in doctrine first. Right. You know, absolutely. root them, sh shower them, comfort right. them, listen to them, be there for them. Right. You know, and um, it, it's also an opportunity, I think, for to invite young people to think about, to reflect on what's going on in the community, to reflect on reflect on the music that they're listening to. I mean, what what does that really say? I like that beat, but have you really listened to the words? And this could be a way to help build um, um, an, 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 uh, analytical skills, um, helping them to begin to analyze and to critique what it is that they're listening to, and then what is it that they're hearing in church, and does it, does it line up? Is there a way that you can challenge that? Is there a way then that maybe you can en embrace some form of it that might help you to find that redemption as you were talking about? So it can also be used in that regard as well. I, I've seen, yes. In the black tradition, we do a lot of praise and worship, and of course we do a lot of dancing. I find the problem is with the unchurched. The church, they arrive at worship. The unchurched is still at praise. And the ultimate is to always enter into worship. But it's always the unchurched that will have the problem. This culture is a little, you know, different than, you know, when I was growing up. Um, that may not have been acceptable, um, but now, you know, this generation, they have so many, I mean, when you turn on the TV, all you see is hip hop and, and rap. And so what better way to allow them to express themselves than through what they see all the time? And if it's a positive me message, um, I've heard the I heard I've heard the statement that um, you can't minister to an iPod generation with an A track. <laughs> you know that was the previous generation. Now we're a part of the iPod generation where they have access to so many different genres of music, and so we have to reach them where they are. You know I'm a classroom teacher. Um, my, my students are so, they're stimulated with internet and with um, the computer that, you know, when I teach, I can't be in front of the room talking to them or talking at them. I really have to engage them in learning. And the best way to allow them, or this generation, to learn and to learn more about God and to engage in their relationship with God is through, you know, what they see, their culture. Um, and then we also have to take into consideration context. You know, you said that that particular video was in Central Park. You know, you may not do that on a Sunday morning, you know, on a stage, but they were reaching to an audience that, you know, you know, me preaching in front of a congregation, they may, those people may not come to see me on a Sunday morning. But they have a new expression of who God is through a hip hop performance. Um, and, and the dances are reflective of scripture, which was great. So 
Um, I'm just thinking, you know, we really have to take into consideration this culture that we're in and the context that we're doing things. And if we want to reach them, we really have to be on their level and, and um, try to engage them where they are. I think it's also very important to know your congregation, to know your context, and to, you know, to know your kids, um, because that's how you reach them where they are. Because you know, if you bring in a style of dance or a style of worship that is contrary to, uh, first of all, the theology and the ethos of the congregation, you're going to have an issue. But also, if the kids aren't into that, then that's not what you offer them. But um, one of the best ways to find out where to begin is to simply ask them, what is it that you want to do? What do you like to do? What brings you joy? What helps you to connect? When are you most present with God? And that is a way that we can begin to, to think about. Maybe that's a clue in terms of how we begin. There's a word that's been rattling around in my head, and I haven't heard it spoken explicitly here, but it's undergirding everything we're talking about, and it's incarnation. Mm. That we worship a God who has taken on flesh and blood and embodied God. And so Jesus comes and meets us where we are, and I, that's exactly what you're talking about. And going back to the whole issue of the sexualization of dance and all that, yes, and... God is not afraid to take on our flesh, so why are we afraid of it? And, and I'm so inspired by everything that you've said this morning that I'm going to take it back to my kids. And thank so you. thank you. Thank you very much. The, um, some of the things that you mentioned, we're doing that in our church, but with the hip-hop, there's still a discrepancy because of the imitating. We say we're imitating the secular world. When do we draw the line that rather that we imitate the world, that the world follow us. So the problem is in terms that in God, you already can be creative. You don't have to imitate the world to be creative. So to get people to follow, what's, what is the direction that your motive behind it? Are you, letting, are you gonna lead them or are we gonna follow them? So that's a, um, where we are right now based on a question of imitating um, should we imitate the secular, or should they follow us? Right, and, and you know, that's a, a really, it's similar to your question. I think it's a fine line. And there has to be a lot of teaching, a lot of discussion. Whenever you engage in these types of ministries, why are we doing this? And so there's got to be a lot of talking about it. This might be the way that kids engage, and they will be able to reach some of their friends. Um, it's not necessarily following them. People said that about Kirk Franklin. And his music, you know, has really touched millions and millions of kids that some of, you know, Helia Jackson, which I love dearly, uh, her music may not have, have had meaning for them. And so I'm not so sure, it's a fine line. And I think that's why we've got to be prayerful. We've got to be discerning. We've got to listen. And we've got to make sure that we're careful as we engage in this type of especially the hip hop, you know, we're getting onto the ed more edgier types of dance, um, the, the ones that are not quite as safe uh, in the church, uh, because hip hop has had such a bad rap uh, in terms of some of the language and you know, the degrading of the women and the violence and the things of that nature. Well, you know that hip hop, if you, if you trace the roots back of hip hop, is very similar to the roots of the African American spirituals. They came to this country out of an African context that in some tribes, in some communities in, in the African context, they have an opportunity at various times throughout the year where everyone can come out and they can critique the government and say anything that they want to say against their neighbor or whatever without any fear of retribution. It's an opportunity to look at what's going on in the world and to say, that's a shame. You have offended me. And it's a critique on their society. And that is embodied in their dance. It's embodied in their music. It's embodied in every aspect of their lives. Well, that music came over to the United States. And hip hop is just simply another evolution of that opportunity to look at what's going on in society and to begin to question what that is and how does my faith then address that? And so I think that we have to kind of do both. 
we offer an opportunity to engage in a new form of worship, but we also have to offer the tools to analyze and critique so that we're doing it in the right spirit. And I see a hand here, and I saw a mic there and here. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> we're covering. <laughs> Yeah, um, one of the things that Edlin and Tim and I were talking about uh, earlier in the week was that the transformation happens after people encounter God. And the methods that we use, the church is not just for church people. Mm -hmm. So by changing our music and embracing different kinds of music, we have the opportunity to reach out to other people and the transformation doesn't happen before. We don't transform them to fit some mold that we already have. We kind of, they, they become transformed by the encounter they have with God through our missions. Thank you, so there are two more and then we'll, we'll bring it to a conclusion. <laughs> I noticed that this whole thing mostly talked about like hip hop and I grew up listening to that so that I can relate to that side too, but my uh, preference of worship is like contemporary Christian, mm -hmm. and th which is the same as my youth. So, and I'm not sure if that's the case ev with everyone here, but a good example of this with contemporary Christian music is, I don't know if everyone has seen the Hill House skit, and it's like, it has a, a beautiful song, contemporary Christian song, and it acts out the different struggles of a teenager and you should check it out on YouTube. It's called the Hill House Skit, yeah. and it, it's a good example of, like I said, um, you know, it deals with drinking and the pressures of like, you know, cutting and stuff, and how Jesus is there with you. And there's a bunch of them like that. So it's not only for hip hop, but also you know, contemporary yeah. Christian and other music like that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. There's one more, and then we'll. Um, like Karen said, we spoke throughout the week. In my particular church, where it's an urban ministry, we're in the inner city with a lot of kids where hip hop is their big thing. You know, they come to church, like he said, bumping the iPod. It's not Mahila Jackson. You know, they're listening to Jay Z, they're listening to the, all the new artists. And the one thing that I, I sat down and talked with them about is what is it about this music that you like? And the biggest answer was the beat. The beat is nice, you know, it's tight, it's on point, I like it, you know? And I said, okay, well, then if the message was more, Christian and spoke more about Christ and spoke more about the things of the Bible, would you listen to it? They're like, yeah, the beat is nice and the words is nice. So we started this whole thing where it was kind of competition. You find a Christian rap and bring it here and we'll see who has the tightest, you know, flow of rap. And so that's what we do now. And they come like, oh, I found this new artist. Yo, he's tight, he's this, he's that. And they sit down and they listen to the lyrics and you really have to sit and engage them and they tell you more about what hip hop is about than I knew. I mean, I'm young, I'm in the generation. But they're like, oh, it's all about the flow. It's all about the beat. It's all about this. And one of my favorite Christian rappers now, his name is um, Andy Mineo. He's in New York. And one of the phrases he always uses is, I love giving old records new flow. Hmm. And if God can redeem my soul, he can redeem a beat. So what he does is he takes all of these hip hop beats and he writes his own lyrics to it. And when you really listen to it, how he matches the scripture with his voice and to the beat, it's a beautiful thing. And these kids fall in love with it and they want to rap about it. But you really have to, like you said, sit down with them in the word first. And that's one thing I did. I said, okay, what do you like to do? And we had a first youth explosion. And you like to rap? Okay, write me a nice Christian rap. No swearing, nothing. And I want you to embody these three scriptures. Okay, you like poetry, take the book of John and find some scripture you like and write a nice poem. You do graffiti, I want you to you know, do something. You, you know, whatever it is that you do and that you love to do, use it to glorify God. And that really opens them up more because we're so used to saying, you know, this is the way worship should be, this is the way it should be. You have to sing this hymn, you have to do this. But telling them whatever gift you have, use it, but make sure it glorifies God. And that's the key to it. Because you know, you really can't force them to do something that's not of their generation. Right. But you do have to set the guidelines for them. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. That very, very nice. Yeah. Well, we are at the end of our time already. But what I would like to do, just uh, in our last couple of minutes, we didn't get a chance. We've talked a little bit, kind of in general, um, 
uh, to talk about in get integrating dance into the church. And some of the ideas that were lifted up um, just a few minutes ago were absolutely excellent. I just wanted to add a couple more. And then we have a closing um, dance that we're going to do, and then we'll be finished. Um, but let me just read this list. And remember, this is a beginning place you can add to it. Integrating dance into the church. Um, remember that dancing, you, you can think about dancing through the Christian calendar, OK? So there are various times of, of the year, Easter, Advent, Lent, uh, that could be opportunities for dance. Explore one of the forms of dance once a month, or as often as you feel comfortable. Um, add a body prayer or a hand prayer to worship, and have the children lead the congregation in dance. Incorporate movement uh, to reading of a scripture. Add a choreographed procession once or twice a quarter. So as the congregation, uh, the, the pastors are coming in. And then organize a prayer service using dance for all of the prayers, for all of the prayers and the scriptures. And so those are just some of the um, ideas that I had generated, but I had hoped to generate more from you as well. But I want to thank you all for your participation. Um, all of you, every time uh, I asked you to stand, just about everybody did, and I was very pleased with that. So thank you very much. I'm going to ask you to stand one more time. And we are going to close with an example of a celebratory prayer. You all will know this song. I'm going to ask you to sing and to move. Uh, and I'll show you the movements first. But all you have to do is uh, follow me. So spread out a little bit. How many of you all know this little light of mine? All right. <laughs> so this is the first, the first movement, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Then the next verse is, everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. And you can keep, keep stepping. Everywhere I go. I'm going to let it shine. And then the last verse is, all in the world, I'm going to let it shine. And then we end with, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Here we go. All right, let's sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let's pick it up. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Yolanda, thank you so much for a wonderful and kinetic and moving in every sense of the word presentation. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.